All right, so it's time. Uh, thank you everyone again for joining. And as a quick reminder for everyone who just joined, we will be tackling um, questions from everyone at the end, uh, but feel free to start leaving your comments on the Q&A section of this webinar. Um, so we'll start with introductions. Um, thank you everyone for making it. Like, I think most of, most of you know how uh, excited I am to be sharing this time with you. So let's do a quick round of intros and we will start with um, Shilpa in Pune, India. Hi Shilpa, How's it? good night, I guess. Good evening. <laughs> yes, pretty late, in the, pretty late in the night. I think uh, I'm an owl, so this is fine. Uh, usual time for me to stay awake and finish the business for the day. Uh, but nice. it's wonderful to uh, talking to all of you here. Thanks for having me. Uh, very quickly, um, I am the uh, studio partner for UX, uh, based out of India, as uh, Juan already mentioned. Um, uh, I sort of started my career uh, about 20 years back, um, and I studied advertising. Uh, went for my first interview when I was selected on the campus, but chose not to go into advertising. Instead, I ran away and did a lot of other things, including space design. Um, I set up my own consultancy. Uh, I set up a lot of uh, young teams for my clients. Uh, they're in-house teams uh, in design and uh, communications. Um, as luck would have had it, uh, moved uh, to digital in the late 90s. The dot-com boom happened in India just about 1999. Uh, so I've been associated uh, with UX when it was not UX. Uh, and I've been there since. I've uh, been very lucky, spent about eight years in Globant now and uh, having a time of my life. Wow, that's a long time. I still remember when we first met in Buenos Aires and I was, I was blown away by Shilpa, but we'll get more um, about that later. Thank you for the intro. Um, next, we have uh, Clemens in their London office. Good afternoon. I guess, Good afternoon. Or... Yes. Yeah, so here it's beer o'clock, <laughs> but I'm still around. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, so a bit of uh, background on me. Uh, so I'm a director at Globant. I'm part of Globant Consulting. Um, and my background is in research, design and strategy. And I studied uh, mechanical engineering. So I have a master's degree of mechanical engineering with kind of a double degree in industrial design. And I started my career um, thinking that I would design things like cars or buses or trains and I've actually been involved in digital quite quickly, um, identifying a need to start thinking about um, the user experience and it was UX wasn't a thing back then. Uh, so I started doing things a bit more um, um, using industrial design methodologies to apply it to digital. Um, and I've always been in situations where I've been part of a team where UX was not a thing. Um, so starting from scratch, helping people, uh, bringing people around this topic, uh, thinking about technology, thinking about the user, um, and then later on moving on to more leadership and management uh, roles. And awesome. um, yeah, and I, I've, been, I've been part of, um, of consulting for more than two years now, so I'm really happy to be a part of Globin as well. Nice. Yeah, and, and I feel like we're getting on a trend here. Like we, we started, I, I really empathize with you guys where you say, like, it wasn't really a thing. We had to talk to people, convince them that we were really adding value um, to, to our customers. And we'll get, again, more of that later. Thank you for the intro. Um, Stephanie, you're up next. Hey, you guys hear me? Yes. So, uh, Great. Uh, I'm in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. Um, and if we take a look back, and one of the things that I'm already hearing is a bit of a trend again, that, that people have really interesting paths that they've taken that are not necessarily linear lines in technology. Um, I have my undergrad degree in psychology and English literature, so uh, not technology. Um, but I was always interested in technology and building and taught myself HTML while I was in school. And I think similarly, time frame is, as I think I've heard some others mention, it was kind of during that dot-com uh, era. Um, and then I decided to go to uh, Carnegie Mellon and study a combination, taking cognitive psychology and combining it with human-computer interaction. So again, before UX was UX, but taking that understanding of psychology and applying it with the technology aspect. Um, 
And then I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and IBM uh, is where I started working, and I moved to Raleigh about 15 years ago with IBM, and uh, IBM was a, a great uh, start for my career because they enabled me to have a lot of different kinds of roles from starting information architecture as a new discipline at the company um, to sponsoring me for my executive MBA, which I did here at NC State. So. For me, that was about rounding out technology and my love of design and UX with also the business understanding and bringing all three of those things together, which I think, again, is part of the, the thread that we're hearing. Um, I have a 10-year-old daughter, and uh, the company that I started here in Raleigh called Point Source uh, is now part of Globant. And so I've been with Globant for um, just around nine months, and, and it's been a a really fun blend of cultures so far. Yeah, and, and from you know from the global side, I'd say we we're stoked when the guys joined, especially Stephanie. You know, when we started working together, um, getting all that experience into the company, just it's a blast of experience that we got, and I think everyone appreciated it. So um, thanks for the intro, and last but not least, my very dear friend Carolina. Um, so well. Um, following a similar trend to, to the ladies, I too have done a few different roles, both in Goldman and before Goldman, um, but I'm probably the harder sciences of the group. Uh, I was um, per education, I'm actually an engineer. I, I joined Goldman as an engineer while, while I was doing development. And toward, honestly, I've done a um, very non standard path where I started. Uh, on the technical path, managerial on the technical path, and then eventually moved on to onto roles that had to do more with sales and um, more related to product, to understanding products, creating them, to eventually now I'm in communications. I'm actually the partner for our state relevant team that manages what normally people would describe it as marketing. Um, but my, my weird path even started before Globant. When, when I was studying, I was giving English lessons to adults so it's it's been a fun ride um what i do want to say also is that in my case um as shilpa i've moved quite a bit again pre globant and, and in globant uh, i lived in argentina chile um austin texas san francisco phoenix so i've i've had a few locations and that's also been a, a really different thing to see diversity when you go to different locations it's a very interesting point and uh, I've been at Golden for 11 years already, more than 11 years. So it's, it's been quite some time. And we all know your heart stays in Texas. Um, it does. <laughs> more of that later. Um, so thank you all for again, making the time um, and sharing with, with everyone your experiences. Um, we'd like to, you know, kind of maybe take us through a, a journey of, uh, you know, how to how you got to this world and uh, of technology and, and, and you know, maybe making, making all these um, uh, great advances in your careers. And uh, you know, we will finish with maybe some advice for, for everyone who's, who's looking at a career in technology. So first of all, I think you, you might, might have started touching on this topic, how you choose technology. Is something you choose, is something you stumble upon, or is something like once you see it, it's like, wow, okay, this, this is what I want to do with my career, and, and how you also uh, follow up question to that. How you also, uh, you know, change whatever you, change the technology world, world through what you do. Um, I guess you know maybe if you want to uh, comment on that, discuss uh, that topic. Wants to go first? Sure. I think. Um it's interesting because we do, at, so at Point Source, I should have mentioned what I'm doing now as well. Um, so as uh, bringing uh, Point Source in as part of a global acquisition, um, I'm still running our Point Source business unit here within Globin, um and as a managing director, also helping figure out um, how do we take some of the things that we were already doing and marry the, the blend of the broader Globin culture. And one of the things that we had already uh, built into our point source culture and something that is going to continue expanding is uh, running a women in technology event once a quarter. And recently we had our women in technology happy hour and we had a conversation with the women who attended about how they 
took their journey towards technology. And it was it was interesting because again, like the, the four women on this panel, um, everyone had a really interesting background and a, a very varied career path. Um, but the question was how many people really uh, identified with the women in technology label and thinking about, you know, do you even describe your job as working in technology? And, and it was interesting even hearing all of us answer. There were so many other things that we said that wasn't directly about, you know, building technology or coding or what people might think of as, you know, kind of the crisp boundaries around technology. Um, touching also on that, as, as the one who code, has coded the most, honestly, my, my case, it was a complete stumble upon it. When I, decide, I had to decide what to study, I literally threw a coin in the air because I was in between architecture and, and technology and just couldn't decide and just flipped it, went there. Um, at that point, I really, really didn't know what it was about. I didn't know what the world offered in itself. And this is something that now with all of this career, I can, I, if I had time, I would have gone back and say, yes, definitely go through this path. Uh, people sometimes think technology, as Stephanie was saying, is, is just the coding, just the hard aspect of it. And honestly, technology now is so much more. And as time goes by, it continues to be more and more and more because it, start, it has already come to our everyday lives. Like our thermostats are, are embedded with technology. Everything is embedded with technology. So um, I definitely think if for many people, it might be a thing of stumbling upon. But once you start discovering the richness that the field has, it's a great place to be in. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue on the theme uh, that uh, Caro has uh, brought up. Uh, I, I studied advertising, it was a choice between uh, choosing medical, uh, because I was probably the only one in the family of, extended family of 60 people who would have potential good grades. Uh, across science, uh, but uh, two people from my family allowed me to pursue uh, art or design, and so I I, I sort of did that. Um, at that point, uh, not knowing what is applied art uh, helped as well, uh, and I think that theme kind of continued throughout my life, uh, at least. Um, I wouldn't say I stumbled upon technology, but it was so obvious to be not there uh, when the dot-com boom happened. Uh, and, and my then boyfriend and now husband kind of pushed me that you should at least know what it is. So yes, I did start at that point uh, coding HTML in uh, uh, simple scripts in uh, Notepad without even the uh, uh, crisp uh, editors that we have now. Um, and then kind of grew on from there, but uh, kind of building off on really the gist is that you have to be able to connect the dots between uh, what is there as problem solving, design, broader uh, picture, the business needs, and obviously what is the technology that enables these uh, connections, right? And I, I've really played um, the role of Eliza, uh, being a UX designer or being in the space of design, but connecting the business needs uh, because you understand business, you understand the user who's at the center of it, uh, but everything is going to be enabled by technology. So not knowing it won't work. Oh, Clemens, you're mute. <laughs> All right. <Yeah. laughs> it's like talking to myself. <laughs> um, I, I would say on my, on my side, I've almost been like, pushed into it uh, because uh, in my family, Everyone, um, I, there's a lot of like very strong female uh, characters um, and they all have scientific backgrounds. So it was almost not an option not to consider this as an option, as, as, as a career. Um, so very inspiring women. So my mom has a PhD in chemistry. She was like a very senior um, person involved in space programs and uh, defense programs. Um, so very, very inspiring. My grandmother also has a PhD in chemistry. Um, I have other kind of my aunts are architects. So for me, I have all those inspiring women around me um, that kind of push me to look into what um, type of career I could have in engineering um, and explore the kind of the tech landscape. But at this time, I didn't have any kind of um, inspiration around me around more the kind of digital tech aspect of things. So I think naturally I went on to engineering school more from the mechanical aspect of um, of this. I was really good at science, really good at physics. 
Um, and this is when I was at school and starting looking at other options for career that um, digital started being a thing. Um, and I realized that there is way more future uh, in my career in digital than carry on with uh, mechanics because everything is going to be enabled by digital at one point and at that point I realized that I needed to be part of this um, and I needed to do this just quite quickly and I was also quite geeky as a person so I was quite, quite passionate about this um, and I wanted to be part of this um, kind of this new trend back then um, and to make this my career. Wow and, and I can definitely see a pattern of you know you were all smart good good grades, um, you know, in your case, Clemens, you know, your, your um, environment had a, a good, you know, um, was good input for you to kind of get into the field of technology and start exploring options for some others. Kado, like, I, I can really relate to that. I was, I was going to be something completely different and then stumble upon technology and there, there's nothing else you can do because it's so amazing and you can li literally transform the world uh, with your fingertips. So definitely, I think a lot of us, and I'm sure a lot of our uh, participants can relate to that feeling, both of those feelings, like getting... Um, uh, getting support from our environment is is super uh, super useful. So I, I was wondering if you guys could expand a little bit more on that. Like, how was um, not only as you decided, but in, in, as you develop your career, what was the role of, of um, mentors and uh, you know whatever you want to choose, family, friends, mentors, or the challenges that they helped you um, overcome. Whoever wants to go first, maybe Clemens, you were. Uh, talking about it so if you want yeah, to sure. um i think um i think it, my mentors the the most impactful one where it's kind of two two type of mentors um are the strong kind of uh, women role models that i could can uh, turn to and um explain maybe kind of specific situation i was facing being a woman um and they helped me explain their situation and how i should approach this um and also had um kind of really um support supportive managers um male and female um that kind of enabled me to do what i wanted to do and gave me the support to to progress in my career uh no matter the gender basically um and i think having those really uh, kind of models and mentors around you is actually quite key um because it helps you to kind of look into what are your almost insecurities um and what's blocking you and how you move to the next level and Stephanie, I think you had, a, you had something to say about that before. Yeah, I think that that um, I agree. I think having um, sponsors and champions is a really important thing for for anyone's career. Um, but finding those people, you know, when uh, as as a, an interesting anecdote here, I think um, when I was at IBM early in career, uh, one of the things that I participated in was a, sort of a fast track. Uh, executive program. And one of the benefits of that program was that they would create um, opportunities for people to sit together and talk with one another about, um, you know, having executive sponsorship and having mentors. And there was a uh, an executive who uh, was a man. And everyone at the table except for me was a man. I was the only woman at this at this table. And, you know, looking back, I think it's really interesting because at the moment, it didn't even register. It wasn't something that I, you know, kind of absorbed in the moment that it was happening um, until as he was giving advice to all of the other junior employees at the table, talking about their careers and ideas that he had in terms of sponsorship and mentorship. And the first thing he said to me was, um, there's a really great women in technology group you should join, a women, super women's group. And, you know, everyone else got advice like, you know, oh, you should look at this industry or, you know, th this is a, a career path that you should consider or here's some experiences you should gain. And the advice he gave me was to go join a women's group. And, and it sort of struck me in that moment as um, a little bit marginalizing and maybe that I wasn't getting that same kind of mentorship and feedback that the, the other employees around the table were getting. However, although that was my, my feeling at the time, now in looking back, because we do see, you know, hindsight 2020, one of the things that I feel like I now have taken away is that it was pretty good advice, <laughs> because although it was maybe not of the same 
quality and characteristic as the other advice, what it did give me was a ready-made network. And those networks are really important. And so I encourage and I feel like we all now have a responsibility to help build those kinds of networks for other women in, that are trying to figure out how to pursue different kinds of careers and what their career, career paths are as well. So time passing gave me a, a little bit of a different perspective on that, that piece of advice. But right. finding those networks and, and being mentors to each other, I think, is a really important part of, of being women in tech. Yeah, and, and that's a great nugget of, of, you know, I think advice that you, you, you gave us all there where, you know, you might interpret, someone else might be giving you, you know, very uh, open heart advice. They, they, they really want you to succeed. You might interpret it, you know, in, in various ways. Like, yeah, he just wants me to, you know, send, go talk to the other women yeah. kind of stuff. But at the end, what really makes a difference is what you make of that. And, and I think that the building a network, you shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't only be women or men or, or you know, certain allegiances, but we, exactly. we would all, all need to share uh, that, you know, that networking mentality across, um, you know, all, all genders and all, um, all characteristics. So, I don't, Kato and, and Shilpa, any, any comments on that? Um, I'm, <clears throat> I wanted to say, I think once you're in your career, it, it's not that difficult to find mentors, even less so nowadays, and things are pretty, pretty steady. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges I had were more in the beginning of my career. I was surrounded by men. I, I was doing IT when IT was the off thing to do. Um, I, I, I've told this, this story before. I was at one of my jobs and I had to put up a sign with, with a pole very high up that said, careful woman here, because there were so many men there that they started doing these crude jokes that I just couldn't deal with. Um, and I think getting past that, finding the strength to say, you know what, yeah, I might be the only one, but I'll, I'll stick with this. I, I like it. I don't care what they think. I'm going to go forward. I'm going to find my way. Um, it's, it's very important. And you, you need leverage. Of course, I, I had a lot of people who trusted me and who came and talked to me and told me how good this was, everything, yada, yada. Uh, but those those initial moments were a lot more difficult for me than than what I have now. Now I have a network, as Stephanie says, you, you develop your network. I have my my strong relationships everywhere, so I know where to go, how to move. At that point, not losing confidence and and not letting the non diverse space get to me um, was was tough, but was critical. Interesting. Um, so I I think. Um, you know, I, I, it never occurred to me, and I was speaking at the uh, uh, Women's Day celebration in Pune also last year, that it never occurred to me to think like that. And uh, me saying this uh, specifically from India, where we are culturally a pretty male-dominated, uh, uh, we, we have that, right? And uh, I think it started with uh, my mom. Um, uh, we, we were two sisters, one brother, um, uh, dad, and mom. And I think she said, uh, you know, don't let any, there was something, I, I, I'm trying to recollect that incident, uh, but it was doing something which was probably a boy thing to do. And she said, don't let anybody tell you that you cannot do this just because you're a girl. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I think I've been pretty much a tomboy. I've had a lot of uh, friends who are men or boys, uh, and they do not even... Uh, uh, think twice before cracking crude jokes in front of me because they just think, hi, your Shilpa is here. Let's not worry about it. So, um, yeah, I, it's never occurred to me. It never, um, I never made it uh, a big issue. But as you grow up the ladder, I think uh, you start realizing that you have, uh, you need your network, you need your support. Uh, there's very few peers. Uh, you learn a lot from your peers. Uh, you need them. Um, and I, I think I reach out to a lot of my uh, male colleagues as uh, much as my junior and uh, female colleagues. So having that support system and sounding board is very important. Uh, but uh, it, it's, I am realizing it only recently. Yeah. And, and also something, again, another nugget of advice that I'm uh, uh, sensing here guys that I really really liked is you know Kato and, and Shilpa when you were work, Kato, you were talking about that that male dominated group of programmers um, you know that's a group of a very tightly knit group 
of individuals that go through a lot of pressure, development cycles, pushing stuff to production, et cetera. And it's hard to fit in, like, whatever you come from, right? And, and I guess the advice there is, like, teams like that are, you know, take, take a, 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 some work to fit in. You have to um, adapt to them. They have to adapt to you. And, but eventually, you know, if, if, if that's what you love, if that, that's what you do well, that's what you uh, perform well at, you know, any, any team will eventually, you know, um, come to, to, to accept you in, in that way. It can be tough. It can be tougher. Um, but, but one has to be aware that team dynamics, like regardless of gender, are, are a thing, right? Does that make sense? Definitely. And uh, uh, all people... Yeah. All, to your point, all people are just people. So, you know, like it's not Absolutely. just you know, whatever the team is, if someone on your team is diabetic, stop bringing donuts in for the snack every time. I mean, there's, you know, it, there's a million things that, that go into learning about the composition of the team and who everyone is as an individual. And so all of those things that make it feel like maybe that you know, the coding team or the programming team has a, a male centric viewpoint or that they like cracking crude jokes. I mean, that's a, a human characteristic, not a gender characteristic. So finding the way that you find some common ground or being open minded about talking to one another, I think is, is how women, men, whoever will figure out how to build those good relationships with their team and build that network that, that we've all been kind of talking about how you find that network. So, so now that we've established that, and again, I think we've, we've stumbled upon some couple of good, good nuggets of information there and good advice. Um, so you, you started talking about, you know, how you got in technology again, somehow um, either being super decided, this is what I do, going to do and, and fight through it or, you know, kind of, frankly, stumble upon it and then this deciding that that was you. Um, and, and there's this recurring topic, of, like, why don't we have more women in technology? And I think one of the things that you guys already touched base on is, you know, technology is not just programming, right? There's a lot of things around it and uh, making, making technology-based products, is a, it's a bigger thing than that. But also there's first the question, where are there so few women programming? So I think if you guys could elaborate a little bit more on you know, how we get more women to acknowledge, either you know, find it, not just stumble upon it, or if they decide this is a, where I want to have a career in, you know, what's the best way to make sure that's, that's a, a seamless process? So uh, I'll start with this one since I'm the closest one to the topic. Um, I think it, it's, there's a lot of cultural aspects to that, but it's something that needs to start very early on. Um, when when I decided that I was going to end up studying, when my coin decided that I was going to end up studying computer science, um, everybody in my family was like, yeah, sure, that's fine. But then I had my extended family that were like, but that's a guy thing, you know? Um, and, and they were very surprised and very puzzled. And um, I fortunately went to a school where we had a lot of resources. We had... Um, high school, I mean, we had an area dedicated, um, we split in half, some people went to language and science, and, and I don't know what, and other people went to, to sciences, I went to a science part. So I had a whole upbringing that sort of led me to that. But still, to this day, there's a lot of situations where women are not encouraged at all to do sciences, that um, we still hear faces that, that focus on gender bias to the, to the more basic levels. You know, the, we still hear the cry like a girl. We still hear things like um, you, women are not supposed to do this or to do that. And, yet, and the reverse. We also hear that men should not follow artistic stuff, which is very, very bad. Um, I think it, we need to start at the younger levels. We need to start when people, when kids are in primary school, secondary school, it's a hard work of making sure that everybody is aware of the options that are there, the, uh, the possibilities that they have to the means that exist to them. I understand that sometimes um, other reasons make things impossible, but uh, making sure that as, as young as you can, you start exposing them to science, you start exposing them to, to science and to arts, you start exposing them to everything. It's not a matter of getting everybody to do science either. It's a matter of anybody can do whatever the hell they want, pardon my French, but anybody can go and study whatever it is that makes them happy. 
it's a matter of finding what makes you happy. And if you're not aware of it, there's no way you're going to go there. But if you are aware of it, then there's, a, there's an option. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and I think that that exposure point is really important across the board. If, if we aren't exposing kids and, and girls especially to a wide variety of different things that they could potentially study, then they'll never um, turn their minds towards those career paths in the first place. Um, finding, um, I think all of us, and you know, as advice to other women that already have roles in technology is to find those, those opportunities to help encourage exactly what Cara was saying, whether it's through you know, a nonprofit organization, or I know it's something that, you know, even this webinar as part of Globin is trying to think about how do we encourage women that build um, through this, this kind of exercise. So um, whether it's early, early and giving them that opportunity to expand or even uh, into uh, college years and internships and helping bring them into um, an environment or a corporate role where they can start seeing what it means to have a role in technology that's broader, as you said, than, than perhaps um, the coding aspect, but broader aspects of technology. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think, I, go, on. go ahead, comments. Go ahead. Uh, I was just saying, like, I'm, I'm totally on board with what, what you, you, um, you just said, um, both of you. I think I would maybe just add uh, one thing on top of that is what is seen uh, from the outside, um, like how tech is um, presented in the media um, and how young girls might, might perceive um, what, um, what the, those kind of uh, models are. At the moment, they're all kind of white male and um, so all the CEOs that are presenting the media they're all kind of white males and all the um, also in movies what what um, uh, developer looks like is that kind of super geeky guy with a hoodie in the in the room and this is not something necessarily inspiring for a young girl um, so there's the kind of the subject matter and um, making sure that um, young, young girls are exposed to uh, that diversity of what they can do but also um, it doesn't look like something cool or something that will uh, welcome women and welcome their kind of sense of identity. Uh, because if you look at some of the numbers, um, young girls are usually um, much better um, at science at school, uh, but they don't pick this as a career. So they have the capability and they're actually, when they're at school, um, they're able to explore this, but this is not what they pick um, to do as a career and this is this gap this why don't they pick this um and it's almost of the time they just don't want to work in this industry it doesn't look interesting it doesn't look fun and um, and when we know all these opportunities we have if you just look at global and how kind of fun it is to uh, work in this environment it doesn't look like an old garage um uh, or in the back room like all our offices are like super colorful it's super social um and that's not something you see in the media at all um, I'd just like to share, um, to just um, um, jump on what you, um, Stephanie was saying about um, being part of charities. Um, I'm part of a charity in London that's called the Institute of Imagination uh, because I want to kind of be out there and inspire young girls. And what they do is to um, kind of shape the next generation of makers. And I wanted to go there to show that you don't need to be um, a guy to help um, young, young children to learn how to code or how to um, kind of just play with cardboard and um, play with your imagination. Um, and what kind of struck me this uh, weekend, um, I had a, a little boy that was here with his mom. And then uh, at one point he said, oh, mom, um, should we call dad? He's going to be better at this. Um, and I found it like really, really bad because that little boy is just surrounded by um, male um, that are involved with technology. And his, his, this is his kind of point of reference. Um, and we just need to be sure that all those kids, kind of, no matter the gender, are kind of just exposed to the diversity we have already in, in the industry um, and are getting inspired by it. Yeah, I just wanted to remind um, everyone uh, in the audience that the actual field of computer science was mostly at most advanced and, and started by women, you know, Grace Hopper being um, a, probably the most prominent example, but, but in the early days, uh, thank you. Um, and, and when you were mentioning data, maybe we can follow up after this, but there's, there's uh, plenty of data showing uh, the dip in um, how many women got into, into computer 
computer science um, in, in more recent years and that coming back up again. But thank you for citing that. It's, there's, there's a huge uh, load of data that, that, you know, it's puzzling at first, but it shows that trend. I, I think uh, just one point to add, uh, thanks JP, is, um, you know, I, I, I was just uh, talking to one of the uh, clients today morning and we created a platform for girls from uh, remote regions uh, in India to have access to education. Uh, it is actually Globin's client. Uh, and so we are, we are discussing about some of the ways we've been associated with that project for two years. Uh, it's a social initiative of Unilever. Um, one of the things that we are discussing is uh, if you look at some of the, um, so there's a lot of engineers coming out of India, uh, it's like medical, you, you either become a doctor or you become an engineer. It's only in the recent years that there's more uh, careers happening. But uh, if you look at just the competition to get into some of the premier institutes in India, like really top-notch institutes, uh, the access to the education to get into those colleges is so difficult. Um, the boys or the parents uh, will send the boys to uh, these regions where they will prep you for uh, entrance exams to the IITs or the premier institutes in India uh, for engineering. And it's, it's like a good four, five, six months sometimes. It's very difficult for parents to send their girls uh, for these kind of things. Of course, uh, there might be uh, other reasons, uh, financial, but other than that financial re reasons if they are taken care of, just access to these kind of uh, preparation, et cetera, is, is very tough. And then if you're not going to get that, you're never going to crack the entrance exams. Uh, you're never going to get into some of the best institutes and you're never going to ever make a career in technology. So uh, we are realizing from the platform and the statistics that uh, there are so many girls in some of the tier two, tier three cities who realize that there's something called data scientists. And they learned it through the platform. And it's amazing to see that people are at least, by the way of the reach um, and the marketing efforts, at least come to know some of these things. Otherwise, the girls would not even know some of these uh, STEM careers, right? So it's, it's uh, amazing. Yeah. And, and then again, I think this is very inspiring for everyone. And I, I just want to share a comment we got on our Q&A. Uh, board Martin Johnson, uh, you know, saying that your experience is very inspiring, especially how you managed to uh, grow and fight your way by using intelligence and strength and, and, and balancing those two. So thank you, Martin. Um, and um, and also, so believe it or not, it's been 40, almost 45 minutes of conversation. I know it, it seems like 10 minutes, but uh, but it's been time flies uh, when it's so interesting. Um, so we have a question uh, from Anna Flemati, who actually points to our next topic. And um, you know, as we start to wrap up this webinar, uh, we didn't want to leave out the work-life balance uh, topic. It's been so, um, uh, you know, in vogue, especially you know for women. But it, we, I think, we all believe it's it's you know, one of the things in our era that we need to deal with uh, across genders, you know, across industries. Um, but we definitely want your take on how you find, how you found that throughout your career, you had to balance life and work and uh, family and uh, how do you see that going, uh, going forward to the future. So uh, Stephanie, if you want to start with this one. Yeah, I think if that is, we could spend hours just on that topic by itself. But you know, I, I guess quickly I would say that I think it's about figuring out what your priorities are and what matters to you, whatever those things might be. You know, if, for me, I mentioned I have a 10-year-old daughter. That's something that matters. Maybe it's exercise. Maybe it's, you know, reading, writing, whatever it is, whatever your priorities are, and, and figuring out how to make enough space in your day for those priorities. And I think the challenges that and and maybe this is uh that maybe this is a, a characteristic that's more common in women maybe it just depends who you are but you know i found over time especially as i was you know maybe mid-level in my career you want to put all of your energy into your job you want to spend all of your energy on um, you know, making sure that you're doing your best work, that your team is growing, that you're empowering them, you know, whatever the things are in front of you. And in the end, because we're humans, we have finite resources. We have 
finite amounts of energy in every day that we can spend on things. And if what you do is, is take, you know, until 6 p.m. every day, spending that energy on, um, you know, growing your career, helping your team, spending your energy in other places, if one of your priorities is your family, by the time you get home, those resources will be depleted. If one of your priorities is exercise or is, you know, focusing on the novel that you're writing or, or whatever it is, um, if you aren't careful about how you spend your energy, then, you know, it's, it's kind of the burden is on you to figure out how do you balance those, those things and make sure that you're not giving away all of your energy throughout the day left with nothing for the other priorities in your life. So the best advice I have is to, to be very crystal clear with yourself about what those priorities are so that you can manage your own time and energy. Perfect. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I think it's, it, it's critical also to understand that a happy person works better. So it's not just about putting all your time and energy into work. If you don't have that balance, you're not going to do a good job because your, your brain is going to be fried. So it's, at some point, you need to figure out how to put that balance. Fortunately, um, our, our industry tends to be pretty flexible in terms of what you can do. For instance, I'm working from home right now with my two-year-old on the other side of the door. Um, having that flexibility, having the resources also gives me options that I wouldn't have maybe in a different field. Um, but it's all about where you want to go and what your priorities are, as Stephanie was saying. That, that's definitely critical. Yes, I, and I, I think once, once you've figured out your priorities, because that's, that's what we've already covered, uh, it becomes easy to communicate with your circle. Uh, and I think that, that does take a lot of pressure off. Uh, so, for example, uh, it's just me and my husband. Uh, we're married for 11 years, but we understand each other and what, and I'm a workaholic. Um, and he likes to uh, enjoy the life, uh, finer parts of life. Uh, but, but then we, you know, you just have to um, be very transparent and open and um, parents and your siblings and your extended families, you have to make time for it. There was a point in time where I just thought work, work, work is all that it is, but then you're going to get burnt out. So finding the balance, very crucial. Every, I think everybody gets into their own rhythm because to, to find your, just like you to find your voice, it takes a while. It, it takes time for you to figure out what it is that matters to you. Uh, but I think just knowing that you have to figure it out and then you, you figure it out uh, and then stay true stay true and honest to that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm totally on board with you. Um, I think it took me almost 10 years to really find my balance and where my priorities are. Uh, early in my career, um, I think it's not necessarily a gender thing, but I'm naturally a quite passionate person and I just wanted to prove myself and do my best. And I was spending hours and hours just working just because I wanted to get it right. Um, and then I found myself just after that being always the only woman in the room, um, also the youngest person uh, in the room. And I felt that I had to kind of do the twice the same effort to kind of prove my credibility because naturally um, I was a woman and it's, it's good in London. I didn't have to fight back that much, but before that um, I was in France and uh, culturally um, uh, the way a women's like kind of positioning companies is also slightly different. Um, so I kind of had to push back and to prove myself again. And then now I feel that I don't have to prove my credibility anymore. Um, I'm in my position um, because I've owned it. Um, uh, and that balance is really about me putting the priorities. Um, and I don't have kids, uh, so I can't, I can't really talk about this challenge because it will be a next step in my life. Uh, but I'm a dancer outside of work, and this is my priority. I'm not going to miss. I'm not going to miss a rehearsal because I will have to go on stage and we're preparing shows. So that's something I'm like, no, I'm not going to um, negotiate on this. But then I give more flexibilities on the rest of the day. So and then um, this is kind of my rule <laughs> and where my priorities are. Yeah, and Caro, you want to say something or no? Okay, so yeah, I mean, I just wanted to quote a, a friend of mine 
who happens to be a guy, but that doesn't really matter. And, um, and, and when he had his first child, he's this very successful entrepreneur. Um, and, uh, he, he totally freaked out, didn't know how he was going to manage. And then, you know, one day he told me, um, Juan, you would be amazed the amount of time that I found, uh, in my life that I thought I did not have. So I guess if you have to, you know, taking from your experience, ladies, like if you have the drive and, and if you have your priorities set and you have the grit, it's, it's just like everyone else. You just, you just make the time you find it um, and you, you, you get organized around it. So, um, you know, very, very interesting to, to see it from your perspective as well. Um, I have, uh, again, we, we're running um, towards the end of the session. There's, there's two things we really want to get to. Um, uh, first of all, we, we're going to answer uh, all your questions in just a minute, um, and then um, that's going to be at the end. Uh, and the last question from each of you would like to see, uh, you know, what would be your advice for someone who's getting to this field, maybe your younger self, uh, maybe someone you've met, um, and uh, yeah, what would be your advice to get in technology, enjoy all that, you know, this field has to offer? And Caro, maybe if you want to start. Um, sure. If, I, I think I'd say the same to my younger self as, as someone nowadays. Um, there, there are a few things that are important. It's not a matter of which field you choose exactly. You can create your own field. You can create your own path. Um, it, our lives are a choose your own adventure kind of book. You can start somewhere and end something somewhere different, completely different. And, and, it's what's happened to all of us here. So it's, it's not just me randomly saying that. So I would tell, tell myself that, um, oh my God, do what I love, continue in whatever path I find appropriate at the time and, um, and just be ready for change and for challenges and for whatever may come. Don't let anybody just put a wall in front of you just because of a, of a label that somebody made which may be a gender label or as in one of the questions that we have, uh, an LGBT label or whatever. Nobody has a right to, to stop you just because of some condition like that. It's, it, it's a huge world. So you can start in technology and if you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. But don't let just the fact that the field is a male, traditionally male dominated field or that it feels like you won't fit in be something that, that stops you. Just trust your heart. The rest. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think um, I agree completely with, with what Cara said. I think that if I look back at, um, if I could rewind time and we all have clearer visions, you know, when, you, when you're looking backwards, I would probably say the advice I would give my younger self is to um, change faster. I think it, it follows a lot of what Cara was saying, but we delay decisions sometimes that we probably know in our guts we should make um, because we're allowing, you know, fear to have a place in our thinking. And you should find more trust in yourself um, and take bigger risks and, and just change faster because time passes more quickly than you want it to. <laughs> and, you know, there's, I can, if I look back at my career, I could certainly pinpoint times where I stayed in a role or, you know, I stayed in a situation longer than I should have. And if I had made a change faster, then, you know, where would I, where, where would things be different down the line? So I would definitely say, you know, look at, if there's something that your gut is telling you, it's, it's like listening to your heart. It's very similar message, right? But, but do those things, maybe the ones that you're most scared of, take a harder look at the things that are making you feel that fear and, and try to get over it. Awesome advice. Uh, Clemens, do you want to go next? Yes. Um, so if I look back, I think I would also tell myself to um, put less pressure on myself when it comes to uh, picking a career and deciding what school to go to uh, because uh, none of the thing I would have learned at school is actually relevant now. Um, and what's more important is to learn how to be flexible, adaptable, and to kind of learn how to learn because that's the key uh, skills I need now. Um, 
and I don't even remember what I learned at school, but it's like not relevant at all now. <laughs> um, I would also tell myself to like trust myself and to not listen to people's expectations um, and just do what I like um, and kind of follow my ID. Um, and I also tell myself that it's not always going to be like pink and nice and easy. And um, that I know I would face um, weird and absurd situations uh, coming from other people. Um, I might have like sexist comments, but those are not that important. Um, I just found myself in some situations sometimes when I was like visiting a factory in China where they had not seen a woman in this building for the last 10 years and they didn't even have like a female toilet. Um, and I would say to myself, just like your sense of humor is your best, like best strategy. Um, I'm really good with this now uh, because it's so absurd. I just like laugh about it and uh, just talk about it with people and just laugh together because uh, that's how you're going to move the lines. Thank you. Okay. Shilpa, what do you say quickly, to yourself? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, I experimented a lot uh, when I started my career. Um, didn't, uh, I almost didn't have a structured career. I, I think... Um, what I would say to myself is have a structured career, but don't stop experimenting. I have a, one slight uh, different take on this question is, um, I think as young, uh, younger, our younger selves, uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm um, and there's a lot of uh, energy. Uh, what I would like to probably say is to my eight year old self, uh, that if you can sustain and keep the same enthusiasm and energy, uh, then, then you, uh, you, sort of done much better in life I think uh, yeah thank you thank you for sharing um, so now we, we for sure want to um, uh, tackle the questions that we have so we're gonna start uh, with a question from uh, Juan Juan asks us to uh, kind of broaden a little bit more um, the uh, the topic of being in a male-dominated environment uh, to also include LGBT minorities, which I think it's, it's awesome that you brought it up. And the question is, what are the things that you did to outgrow this challenge? How did you grow a thicker skin and advance your career despite the fact that it's hard to get as much validation um, in, in that working environment? So Carolina, maybe you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, so honestly, I think it has to do a lot with what Clemens said. It's finding the sense of humor, finding a way to cope with it that does not focus on, on the problem at hand. When, when I said the story about the sign that I did, this was me having fun with it because I had been telling them for a gazillion times to not be so crude, laughing about it. And I said, you know what, guys, I'm going to put a sign that way you'll remember. Um, I think getting to those points where, where you really understand that it's not, it's not about you. Honestly, when people have these situations, it's about ignorance on their end, mostly. It's about them not having been exposed enough to, to situations. So you need to understand that it's not personal to you. It's a problem that they have. And people are, are continuing to evolve um, communities, minorities, all the gender fluidity, all of the concepts that nowadays, nowadays exist didn't exist way back. So these things are, are going to continue to change and more people are going to be acceptant of this. In the meantime, with the ones who are not, just as you would with your everyday life, you need to find a way to not let it affect you because the moment they see that it affects you, of course they're gonna pick on it. So humor for me was probably one of the best ones. Um, knowing that I was doing a good job, like I knew my work was, was good. So that made me feel validated and also gave me an edge to say, you know, I can ignore this. I can let this be and not focus on that for a while. Um, I think getting those pieces and, and figuring out what works for you is definitely the best way to go. I don't know if any of the ladies want to add anything. Stephanie, I think you had a comment. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love what you said. I think that there's um, recognizing that if that there's something that feels challenging or something about the environment doesn't feel good, that it is. Uh, an opportunity for uh, humor, for sure. <laughs> I completely agree. The more that we can have a sense of humor, the better we all feel. And, you know, endorphins and all of those things are very healing. But also that it's a learning moment. I think to the point that, you know, people often you have to believe are coming from a good place. And that place may just be one where they don't have uh, either culturally or in their experience a, a broader understanding. 
And maybe you can take whatever feels like an uncomfortable moment and turn it into something that expands somebody else's horizons a little bit. Um, and I think that when you feel like you can take an action, that cures fear, right? So that cures things. If you feel like you can make some kind of change. So if you can see those moments, if you can find a way to see those moments as something where you're giving back by changing a perspective, I think that helps everybody. Yeah, thank you. And our last question, sorry, from Harshali uh, is, in general, modest and self-spoken women uh, suggestions or advice are not taken seriously or sometimes people doubt on their aggression. Uh, also, their hand becoming lady boss is also difficult. How women can set up their standards or bar of acceptance and create a bridge in between? And I would also suggest that's also true for some men that are shy. Um, hi. But please, um, maybe Shilpa uh, Clemens, you can take this one. Sure. So I, I'll, I'll go with this. Uh, and, and this comes to me very uh, often is that, um, you know, if, if, you, uh, if, you, if you're a tough person, and I say person uh, out of choice, um, uh, it, you know, it's, it's conditioning, I think. Uh, if it is a, a man being tough, it is considered as a no-nonsense guy um, and just kind of sort of taken it with that. Uh, but if you're a woman, uh, I'll, I'll keep this uh, a little parliamentary language, uh, but you're considered a headstrong person. Uh, and I think it's okay. Uh, I got some of the best advice uh, from uh, some of my uh, women colleagues is that you cannot uh, continue to always be seen as nice to everybody. So uh, take tough stands uh, and don't worry about the judgments. Of course, uh, there are going to be ups and downs and you're going to be affected, but learn to live with it. And uh, I, I, I think, yeah, just, just be a person. Don't think of yourself as a guy or a woman and live with it, live with it, yeah. Awesome. And I would maybe just add on this that um, there's a difference between like work and your personal life and um, the person you might want to be with your friends and your family is not necessarily the person you have to be at work. Um, and as any other human being, uh, no matter the gender, you're here to achieve a task and you just need to uh, develop your personal skills to understand um, how you're going to achieve that and how you have to communicate with um, uh, the people you have to interact with. And if they see you as a lady boss, well, that's their problem. But if that helps you to achieve what you're here for, well, that's what you have to do. And it's not necessarily a problem. Um, yeah. And what becomes a problem is when the person in front of you feels offended because you're being bossy. And um, it's for you to understand how people kind of perceive you and how you have to adapt it to make it work. Yeah. And, and I think that topic in and of it itself would totally like lend itself for its own webinar and, and session. Um, but I want to thank you all for, for attending. We are three minutes over time. Um, we, we could keep going and I, I can see like a lot of people really stay till the very, very end. So uh, we definitely really appreciate it uh, when you guys uh, show your interesting topics. At Globant, this is very important for us, um, you know, having, having consistent, cohesive, cohesive teams where everyone can bring the best. Uh, to the table, it's in our best interest. So um, this this is a very core uh, core topic to us. Um, I just want to close by saying that if you like this session, uh, let us know. You can write to us at hello at globin.com. If you are already a Globin employee, uh, you can you can get in touch with Eileen and the uh, producing team in Argentina, um, or even write to me directly, Juan J U A N at globin.com. Uh, Thank you everyone for coming. We hope you have a, a lovely end of your week and a lovely weekend and I'll, I'll see you all in the next uh, webinar. Bye.